start the actual uh, session now. Um, welcome to all of you. Uh, my name is Jørgen Mügen, uh, and I will be your host of today's webinar of uh, hardware integration uh, with TouchGFX. Um, the team we have today, uh, you, you can see it here. Uh, in a minute, uh, Martin uh, will, will take over. Um, but beside uh, Martin here in, in front, yeah, uh, you see Jesper. Jesper is our product manager, heading our technical team. He's available answering questions as we go along. And we have Soren taking care of all the technical stuff, making everything uh, go smoothly, hopefully. Okay, thank you for, for joining uh, everyone. Um, and, and please be in mind, uh, put up questions uh, as we go along. Uh, we will uh, come back to, uh, on them uh, in writing and also some of them taking them uh, verbally. To you, Martin, please. Thank you, Jan. Hi, guys. Um, so my name is Martin. I'm a software developer with uh, Drama Graphics and I'll be uh, your guide in today's webinar. So. What we'll be doing today is try to get a uh, better understanding of the TouchGFX structure generally, and we will develop an application for uh, the STM32F769 discovery board, this board. Um, and we'll be using STM32 cube drivers to interact with a few peripherals. And we'll, uh, once we've uh, completed all the, the board setup and verify that all the peripherals are working, we will actually uh, create something that we call an application template in TouchGFX. It's basically a uh, chunk of uh, code that uh, you can base all your graphical applications on and that can be distributed and used from within the uh, TouchGFX designer. And as Jan just said, just please ask questions as we go along. After each uh, topic, I'll try to take a short break so we can take some questions. Uh, so yeah, go ahead and, and do that. Um, so let's see, uh, our goals today, uh, as we covered just before, uh, won't be uh, involving porting TouchGFX to new uh, microcontrollers and new boards. Uh, we won't be covering uh, stuff like uh, general uh, real-time operating system principles and primitives. We'll be using some, uh, and we'll get into those, of course. Uh, we won't be getting into CubeMX application uh, generation or project generation. And we won't be getting into specific uh, STM32 cube drivers. Uh, so what you can actually do is you can go to this link. Uh, this is for the uh, the uh, F7, the STM32 F7. You can actually go there, download the cube package, find a lot of projects and examples that relate to I2C, uh, UART, Quad Spy, whatever. Uh, and you can use that C code and you can kind of use it uh, along with what we're going to learn today, which is how to kind of uh, uh, interact with peripherals and uh, reflect those changes inside our graphical application, touch effects application. So uh, that's a good idea to, to do. Um, okay, so are there any questions at this point, Jan? No. Okay. Not at this time. Good. Let's uh, carry on. So the agenda today is try to you know get from A to C. Uh, let's start by talking about relevant hardware. What, what does it take? What is the minimal hardware setup to kind of uh, run your ChargeFX applications, uh, static applications? So uh, let's talk about software layers in ChargeFX and how STM32 cube drivers on ST devices kind of uh, affect those layers, uh, and uh, let's uh, go uh, into talking about application architecture uh, when we start develop developing an application. Uh, so we'll be talking about the model view uh, presenter pattern that we use uh, to uh, for our applications. We'll then get into the uh, the core topic for today, uh, how to integrate with hardware. So. What we'll be doing today is actually just integrating with a few hardware peripherals on this board, uh, which is going to be uh, just an LED and a button. Uh, and this is because you know then you can actually download this uh, the code that we have available today, and you can kind of run it on your own board and, and play around. 
And we'll finish up by creating the application template and, and try to distribute that and use it in the, the designer. And then we'll finish off with a summary and then a, uh, a Q&A, all right? <clears throat> so let's uh, get into it. So this, this, uh, um, this figure is actually something that you may have seen in a previous webinar. Uh, this is something that tells us this is the basic uh, hardware that TouchGFX needs uh, to run. So we need some RAM for frame buffer, uh, internal, external. We need some flash for our image assets. We need a microcontroller, of course, and we need a display that is uh, typically touch enabled. Uh, we have customers that don't use uh, touch displays, but you can still use TouchGFX, of course. Um, so what we'll be adding on today is just uh, interacting with some of the peripherals on this board, uh, which is the LED and the, the one of the buttons, as we mentioned briefly. Uh, and uh, once we've done this, then we have kind of a chunk of code and board uh, setup or configuration code that uh, tells us that this, this board is actually working. And then we can, uh, at some point in this webinar, kind of uh, turn that into an application template that we can distribute to other developers that they can use to develop their graphical applications on top of this particular board or any board. Any questions at this, at this point, Jan? Well, uh, only some uh, general questions we will answer here uh, in writing. Okay, sure. Okay, so you might also have seen this particular slide in a previous webinar. So this is the uh, general software layer uh, architecture for, for TouchGFX. So we have on top the application layer, you know, you write your code, your uh, screen definitions, uh, your, you have your graphics and your text definitions. Then we have the core, which is where all the rendering, uh, timing and event handling occurs. Then you have the operating system abstraction layer, which is uh, what we require uh, uh, developers to provide if it's an uh, operating system we don't support so that we can synchronize frame buffer access uh, through some OS primitives like uh, semaphores. Um, then we have the hardware abstraction layer in TouchGFX, which is basically uh, the touch controller, interrupt handling, priority, synchronizing with LCD, uh, um, handling DMA transfers, uh, and stuff like that. So generally, this uh, HAL layer is where uh, we drive the application forward and protect the frame buffer. And this is something that we won't be covering today, but will probably be, probably be a separate webinar because it's uh, quite extensive. So today we'll just be covering uh, this particular board and ST has already provided the board package for us uh, through the link that I provided earlier. And we'll be using that uh, to kind of make the, an application come to life on this board and so we can interact with some of the peripherals. So what uh, parts of this, these layers are actually affected by uh, cube drivers? Uh, so we have uh, the board package, which is the um, kind of all the, the hardware uh, bring up, uh, setting up the quad spy, setting up the RAM, uh, setting up the LCD, etc. And then we have the driver package, which is uh, more touch GFX minded, which is uh, the MCU that we need we need to handle uh, synchronization with the, the LCD. We need to uh, specify how to initialize DMA transfers, and we need to use some uh, cube driver code to uh, interact with the touch controller, like I2C or something. Um, and so I'll just briefly just show you something that if you're familiar with uh, STM32 cube. You can actually see here that this uh, folder here is something that you may recognize from uh, some of the STM32 cube driver packs. This is just a ba basically a copy of that, and it contains all the uh, all the uh, BSP files for this particular discovery board. And here we have a folder which is more MCU specific. This is also something that you'd recognize if you uh, knew the structure of the uh, cube driver packs. So this is uh, this contains a lot of files related to the F7. Um, 
So that's just a quick intro there. Okay. So one way to set up your board is to use something like CubeMX, uh, which generates uh, C projects. Uh, you can use, I mean, some of the, the driver packs that they've already provided. Um, and this is something that is required. Uh, and, and as I said, we won't be going into specific drivers today, but we'll be touching on some of them and uh, go through the, uh, the queue packs and take a look at the ex examples and projects to get specific examples for I2C. And then you can use it uh, along with what we're going to learn today. Um, so, so TouchGFX is not a display driver. It's basically a piece of software that can render user-defined screens to a frame buffer. Uh, relying on hardware events to drive that process. And that's what a, a TouchDFX port is. So every time I mention STM32 cube drivers today, it's gonna be to basically to communicate with peripherals only. So all the porting stuff is, is not uh, gonna be mentioned today. So, and we are working on creating, on improving the integration between uh, STM32 cube and TouchDFX. Um, so before we dive into uh, the next topic, let's uh, see if there are any questions, John. Well, uh, yeah, let's uh, let's let's uh, take uh, a few of them. Um, yeah, yeah uh, but but they are in in, in the more general range here. Um, uh, yeah, do, do you have available projects on TouchDFX.com with communication task, UART, CAN, and so on? Uh, we don't specifically, and as I mentioned before, this is because if you download uh, for ST, the STM32 Cube driver packs, you have a wide range of different projects with a, that touch on UART and I2C usage, uh, Quad Spy, uh, SDRAM setup, everything. Uh, so I, I recommend that you check those out. I think you'll find all your answers inside those packs. And then what I'm gonna show you today is how to use some of that C code that you'll find in the Cube driver packs, uh, how you can use that code to kind of integrate uh, or make your applications and touch effects come to life. So no, we don't provide specific examples for different peripherals because this is something that's very board specific. And for these ST boards, there are so many different examples available already uh, provided by ST. Yeah. Okay, so let's dive into the application architecture uh, before we start developing. Uh, so a brief uh, recap of uh, this uh, slide. This is also something that you might've seen on a previous webinar. The right side is something that was covered in the first webinar. Uh, the last time. So I've kind of tried to gray it out a bit because we won't be focusing on that much today. Instead, we'll be focusing on the, the gray box, the uh, backend control system and its integration with the model. So the model uh, in is kind of the heart of TouchDFX uh, applications. Basically, um, the model will get ticked by a uh, rate of, you know, we're basically gonna be synchronizing with the uh, LCD. And so the model is gonna get ticked at maybe 60 Hertz. So you could do all your uh, hardware integration here, but you might risk uh, blocking the GUI task. So um, what you can do is uh, if you have something that doesn't take a long time to sample, you can, you can do it in the GUI task in the model tick. Uh, maybe you don't want it to be something to be pulled at 60 Hertz, so you could kind of skip some of the ticks and then do it uh, less frequently. But I mean, you're not gonna get a very finely granulated uh, control of your uh, polling or your interaction in this way. So so what you could do is um, just, you know, add on, add on some more tasks. Uh, and it doesn't matter if, you know, if it's not an important task, you could give it a lower priority because the GUI task sleeps a lot while it's waiting for DMA transfers to complete. So this might be a fine way to do it. And this is what we're gonna be doing today. We're gonna to be basically creating uh, three tasks, a GUI task, a task for the uh, LED interaction, and a task for the button interaction. Um, yeah. So this is the application that we'll be making today. Uh, on your left, you have a basic image. So what we'll be using this for is we're gonna be using the button uh, on the discovery board to drive an animation 
uh, based on this image. And on your right, you have a simple toggle button, which will uh, enable and disable a green LED on the board. And uh, we'll have a webcam that kind of shows you uh, what goes on when we program the board. Um, so I've, I've tried to highlight uh, what we'll be interacting with. So yeah, the user button and uh, one of the LEDs. Okay, so we'll be uh, creating an application on the STM32F769 discovery board. We'll be interacting with the LED and the user button. We'll be doing it two ways. Actually, we'll be uh, configuring the button as an, a basic GPIO input, and we're gonna be uh, configuring as an external interrupt, uh, connecting it to one of the interrupt lines and using multiple tasks, uh, free RSS tasks. And we'll be using queues for uh, the inter-task communication. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll try to show the relevant code changes for each of these. Um, so, and I'll, I'll try to take it slow because uh, uh, the update frequency of the, uh, uh, the webinar might not be uh, fast enough for everybody. So I'll try to take it slow so that we won't uh, miss any code. Okay, so we'll start off by creating a simulator version. Uh, and the peripherals we'll be using here is we'll be using the keyboard as the input peripheral, as the button. Uh, we'll use the console window as an output peripheral just to see that we can turn on and off an LED. Um, for the target version, we'll uh, be touching on, this is just to show you that we'll be using some of the STM32 cube files here we'll be uh, using the GPIO uh, C file, which is uh, MCU specific, and it uh, relates to interrupt handlers, among other things. And then the discovery.c file, which is board specific and uh, allows us to set up and interject with the LED and the user button. Um, and then I will be connecting the user button. The user button is connected to the uh, one of the external interrupt lines, line zero and we'll be using uh, defining an interrupt handle for this purpose. Um, so what we'll be doing is uh, uh, through the designer, you can run the simulator uh, in a simulated environment, and you can also run your application on target. And what we'll be doing actually is uh, we'll be using ST-Link, this utility here. Uh, so basically, so we have uh, an external flash loader configured here, and we'll uh, can connect to our targets, uh, and we can program this board using this, or we can use the make files that we generate using the designer, which already uh, uses this tool uh, in a command line version. Okay. So <clears throat> briefly on the designer. So we had some questions on the first webinar that we thought it would be a good idea to integrate into this one. Uh, so the designer actually just generates code based on the contents of your project, and it only touches the generated folder. So you kind of you work in uh, uh, screen definition classes that are derived from the generated ones, which means that the designer is not going to be overriding any of your work. You can add any additional target-specific uh, code files uh, to your uh, compiler projects, and it won't get overridden. So We'll just be using the designer to generate uh, some code for us. Uh, and then we'll, we'll be uh, uh, modifying some of the inherited versions of those classes. Um, yeah. So let's, before we dive into that, uh, see if there are any questions, John. Yeah, we have one. Uh, well, um, uh, yeah. Uh, the the uh, I think you had to open the uh, e editor. Uh, what is the name of the uh, editor Martin is using? It says. Oh, oh this one. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, Sublime Text. We actually got the same question in the last webinar. So uh, some of us use this editor. It's uh, kind of like TextMate if you use uh, Max. Um, it's a pretty fast uh, editor. Uh, it's, it has a good fuzzy search. So if I want to find something like the model, I'll just type something, and it'll give me some suggestions. Uh, so anything I can type anything, it'll give me some suggestions. It's pretty easy to navigate. 
Yeah. So or, or actually, we we got an input here that that it's really hard for them to 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 actually to see uh, the, the fund is too small. Uh, maybe this is uh, I don't know if if you can make it bigger. How about that? Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Can we get some uh, input on on this size? Yeah. Please please come back on, on if if you are able to to actually read it now. It. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So before we dive into um, Yeah, so any any other questions, John? No? Okay. Good. <clears throat> okay, so let's <clears throat> let's open the design and start. Uh, so this is the application that we saw previously on a slide. So this particular image here is going to be, um, we'll be using uh, that image to kind of drive an animation here. So you can see here, it's a basic image. We also, uh, the design also supports something called an animated image. Uh, but we'll basically, we want to control this image uh, and it's uh, the way it looks by controlling the uh, button on the, um, the board. And this particular button is what we'll be using to control the LED. It's a toggle button, so it's either on or off. And we have one single interaction uh, defined in this design and that is when this button is clicked, we can call a new virtual function that will define the name of here. And that is something that we can then override inside our derived classes and then add some custom functionality. Okay, so um, let's have a look. So what I'm gonna open now is the, uh, the base class for uh, the uh, screen one. So I'm not sure if you all saw. One comment, uh, Martin, uh, yeah. split screen is, is too small uh, to, okay. to actually to see. The, it's, it's a comment. Let me just open this so it's full screen. How's that? Okay. So screen one base is something that is the HP and the CPP file are generated by the sign as you can see up here. So the path is generated, GUI generated. So this is the files that we're, uh, these are the files that we're looking at now. So we check out what the design has generated for us. It has generated a button handler for the toggle button, and it has created a virtual method that we uh, asked it to, the updated LED state. So what it says here is that override and implement this function in your concrete view, okay? And if we check the uh, code for this, so we're still inside the generated GUI generated folder. Here, the callback handle for the button, which is defined like this, this is also generated by the signer. It checks, is this the button that we press, then call this virtual function, right? So now we can kind of uh, get to work. So we're actually done with the designer now. We've uh, kind of uh, created our layout and we've told the button that uh, it should uh, actually be calling a virtual method when, uh, when it's pressed. So let's just uh, minimize this for now. So if we check the screen one view, this is the uh, inherited version of the base class that was generated by the designer. So you can see this is located inside GUI, include, and GUI source. And the other uh, generated screens were located inside generated, GUI generated. So if we check out this file here, so basically what we've done here is override the virtual method, update LED state. So for now, we're just discussing the LED uh, flow throughout the application. Um, and if we check out the view, which is located inside uh, the GUI source folder. Um, basically what we're gonna be doing when this method is called is we're gonna be talking to our presenter uh, and telling it the state of the button, the current state of the button, which might be on or off. And um, let me just go back to one of the slides here. So the flow is basically the, Presenter updates the view, 
the presenter can update the model and receive state changes from the model. The view can talk to the presenter and receive events from the uh, presenter. Uh, and we'll be using uh, the model to kind of make all this happen. Okay, so let's have a look at the um, model for a second. So what happens here? So basically what we talked about before was that the tick method of the model was kind of the heart of the application. It gets ticked uh, based on the synchronization of the, the LCD, right? And so uh, here uh, we're going to be, instead of doing our sampling here, we're going to be talking to some uh, free access message queues. And I'll be getting into that as well. But if we take a look at the screen one presenter, so the view just called this uh, particular method, right, with the state of the button. The presenter, as we just saw on the uh, slide, uh, with our architecture slide, is going to call the model with this state. So if we check out this method on the model, which is located inside the GUI source model folder, for now, since we're just using the uh, uh, the console as a peripheral, we'll just be printing out the state, right? And we'll be saving the state, the state and we'll be updating the LED state, but this is only if this is not a simulator. This is for the target version. So now we're just kind of verifying that our behavior in the simulator is correct. So what are we gonna use for uh, simulating the button? We're gonna be using uh, something a method called handle key event, which we can override inside what we call the front end application. This is located inside uh, the common uh, folder, right? So we'll just be calling a model if the key is one, calling model, uh, a method on the model called button pressed. And uh, this is the same, we'll, be see, we'll see that this is the same method that will be called, uh, let's go back to the model. The same method that will be called if we receive something from the button task. So that's just uh, a teaser. Okay, so uh, I think we're ready to try this application. So we've just verified that you know the, the flow of the button from the view into the model, and we verified what happens from the peripheral, the front end application, the key event from the keyboard, and it's going to drive uh, this application. Uh, it's going to drive the, the um, animation, and if we just take a quick look at that, what it's going to be doing, it's going to be calling a method called advanced animation. Uh, it's going to change the bitmap ID of this image, and it's just going to uh, keep cycling that until it hits the maximum uh, ID, and it's going to reverse the direction, and then it's going to reverse again when it hits the base ID. So let's... Um, Let's just try to build this application and run it. So this is actually something that you can achieve from the designer by just clicking uh, Run Simulator. But uh, I like to use the environment here uh, because then we can kind of see what's going on. So the environment is something that you probably have on, on your desktop. Look, looks like this. So let's see it. So here we go. So this is our peripheral, uh, which is the uh, LED for now. So when I press one, this is gonna simulate a hardware pressed button, right? So it's gonna advance, advance an animation. We can keep it pressed. So it's gonna continuously update like this. We can single step it. We can click the uh, button and it's gonna update the LED state, right? Okay. So now that we've uh, kind of taken care of that, uh, let's uh, let's go into talking about how to actually integrate with our hardware. This is the most important, uh, most interesting, interesting thing today, I think. So basically, we'll be defining two tasks. Let's have a look at how those are defined. Now we'll just uh, be going to the target main.cpp. We have three tasks. We have the GUI task, which we always do. We have two additional tasks called the LCD task and the button task. And something that I mentioned that we wouldn't be, wouldn't be covering today is the hardware initialization and the touch defects initialization. And 
So this hardware initialization is based, basically where all the STM32 cube driver code is working and matching, setting up the peripheral, setting up the quad spy, the RAM, uh, the LCD, etc. And this is where all the, the touch defects magic happens, uh, which is what we call the touch defects port. So we're going to be defining, uh, this defines which bit depth to use, uh, which DMA uh, class to use, how those DMA transfers are going to be happening. And then we're just going to start the scheduler. So if we go back to the model, what we can see here is that uh, the only input to the, the application is the, uh, the button press, right? So the LED interaction is happening from the view. So we're, we're receiving a, a press on the screen, and then we'll, we're, we're going to be wanting to uh, activate one of the LEDs. And for the button, we're going to be uh, continuously checking if a particular queue has a message for us, and that means the button has been pressed. And uh, for the LED state, when we click the, uh, uh, the target button on the, the view, what happens is that this method is going to be called, and then we're going to send a message to a different message queue, which is uh, in the uh, LED task. So let's have a look at the LED task. So here uh, we're going to create a message queue. We're going to, this is actually a uh, STM32 cube call, right? So we're going to initialize one of the LEDs. We're going to continuously, every 200 milliseconds, we're going to be checking uh, this message queue if the GUI task has sent us a message. And we're going to be turning it on and off depending on the value. Uh, these on and off methods are also STM32 cube calls. So for the button task, and these are just located inside the target folder. You can place these anywhere you want. These are not files that will be overwritten by the designer, as long as they're a part of your make file or your, your project. Uh, so here we're going to be initializing uh, the button in a GPIO mode. And we're going to be sampling the state of that button every 50 milliseconds. So this call and this call are both STM32 cube uh, driver calls. Uh, we're going to be creating a uh, button message queue that we're going to be using to communicate if from, from this task if we experience the button press. And this is something that this is the message queue that the uh, GUI task is evaluating in its tick method continuously. Okay, so I think we're ready to actually try this application, right? So instead of uh, calling make simulator, we're going to be calling the make target GC make file. And I've already programmed the external flash uh, because there's a lot of images involved in this application. So instead, we'll, we can just uh, flash the uh, internal flash with uh, the code changes. So, and uh, do we have, uh, yeah? Okay, so it's programming the board. Okay, so you should be seeing now. So basically what happens here is that when we press this button, uh, the green LED is actually turning on. It's turning off. And this is because of the flow that we talked about. Uh, from the view to the presenter to the model, uh, from the model through a uh, message queue, a free access message queue, to a task that continually pulls this uh, message queue for information. For the button, we can single step as we did with the uh, keyboard, or we can continuously advance the animation. So what happens here is that the uh, button task had a free outsource queue that it used to communicate uh, with the GUI task, and the GUI task continuously checked if there are any values, any information inside this message queue, and then calls the, this is something we need to see here, from the model again, button pressed, we call the model listener, a uh, method on the model listener. And the model listener is something that all presenters, is an interface that all presenters implement. And if we follow that flow, What we can see here is that we override this method because we're interested in the signal. And if we go to the code, we'll actually just be calling the view and telling it to advance the animation. And we saw the code for that 
already. So this is just uh, to show you. So now we've uh, talked about the flow all the way from a peripheral through message queue in a task to another task from that uh, task uh, to the active presenter and then to the view and the other way around from the view to the presenter to the model uh, through a message queue to a different task that evaluates that and then talks to a peripheral. Okay. So something else I've prepared here is to have a, um, so this was a GPIO configuration of the button. So what we can do actually here is uh, make it interrupt based instead. And this kind of changes a little bit how the button task looks. So now we're not doing anything inside the task. Uh, we can use it for something else so we can remove it um, and then define the message queue somewhere else. And then we have this because the button is connected to the, uh, uh, the external line zero. We'll define this interrupt handler, uh, which is defined inside the interrupt vector table as well. Uh, we'll be checking if this message queue already has a message waiting that hasn't been taken by the model yet. And be, then we'll be sending a message uh, from this interrupt handler. And just notice that we'll be sending it, uh, we'll be using a different method that is called from ISR. So this version of the XQ send uh, is basically just a version that does not have a code to block your task or to halt your task. So you can actually also call this from uh, from a task, but uh, you won't uh, get the uh, expected behavior, maybe. Uh, in the end, we'll be calling the. Uh, this is actually a uh, call to STM2, STM32 cube drivers as well. So what happens in this uh, method? I won't be showing that. Is that it's going to clear the interrupt so that it won't be firing all the time. So again, this is something that is STM32 cube specific that we can use. Uh, based on this driver package. So let's just see if the behavior has changed now. We'll be compiling it, uh, program, programming the board again. And basically, so the behavior has changed now because what will be, will be only be uh, getting a call to this interrupt handler every time we press the button, right? So the LED is still working and the uh, button is now only single stepping the animation because we're only going to be receiving uh, one interrupt every time it's pressed. So that was just two different ways of using STM32 uh, cube driver code to kind of uh, uh, perform this uh, peripheral interaction, right? So uh, just to summarize, you could use your uh, GUI task model tick if your sample uh, time was small, like maybe a millisecond. And we could use tasks to kind of have that uh, more finely granulated. And uh, since the GUI task is sleeping a lot while it's waiting for DMA transfers uh, to the frame buffer to, com to complete, we can actually just, uh, so it'll sleep a lot and, and, and our uh, peripheral task will get scheduled in, scheduled in so that's fine. Um, so let's uh, turn back to slideshow, see if there are any questions. Jan? Yeah, thank you, uh, Martin. Um, yeah, yeah, we, we actually we have a lot of questions, and this is great. Uh, and please keep them coming. Um, one about the model view presenter. Uh, uh, why why using this? Uh, and what what are the advantages of using the model view presenter? Approach. Well, it's a it's a good abstraction uh, pattern. So basically, uh, the model view presenter pattern, uh, uh, as compared to the MVC pattern, is something where the view is actually active and active uh, uh, has has an active role in this application. And uh, we can the presenter is the middleman, so it talks to both the model and the presenter, and uh, in, in, uh, since we just talked about hardware integration and peripheral integration, this is a good way to kind of have a uh, asynchronous access from the model to an active presenter. So the model can just uh, say, are there any presenters that are interested in this particular message? And if an active presenter isn't, it won't have that method implemented. 
So for us and for this general flow of how we do these applications, this is a nice uh, architecture. Yeah, and yeah, thank you. And and we, and we can add that is really recognized way of doing uh, UI uh, applications. We have uh, also, but uh, also uh, some general. Uh, some is pointing at at supported IDEs and and what is actually available in Trusty FX evaluation. Can, can you comment this? Yeah. So uh, the touch and, and and one is specific specific uh, uh, asking for Kyle uh, Microvision Five is if this is supported. Sure. So the TouchDFX evaluation version has no functional limitations. Uh, the only limitation, as as you can read in the license agreement uh, when you install the designer, is actually that you, you cannot use it to create projects or uh, products. So there are no limitations except that you'll have, uh, you won't have the ability to create products and you'll have a watermark that appears uh, randomly. Uh, what we're doing actually when we uh, use the designer is we are creating Kyle and IR projects and Visual Studio projects and GC make files for a particular application uh, with Kyle 5 support as well. Yeah. So what you're saying is that, that yeah, the, 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 the Kyle Microvision 5 IAR is fully supported. And, and except yeah. pro pro projects are, are, are coming uh, pre prepared for, for, for these IDs. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly, and but for some uh, supported boards, uh, the Kyle version is still Kyle 4. Uh, we haven't gone back and upgraded all the different projects uh, every time a new ID um, version comes out. And we have an additional comment to this. Uh, what about MCU Expresso for IMX? Yeah, so um, I'm not quite sure about the exact roadmap for this, but uh, this is something that we are looking at and and have uh, tested inside the lab. And I, I can add actually for 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 some uh, boards, uh, it, it is uh, supported from uh, MCUX Expresso uh, projects are are created for 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 some of the the uh, uh, NXP boards. Yeah. Okay, so let's uh, continue. <clears throat> so now that we've kind of verified that you know the hardware is working, the per peripherals are working, we're kind of happy with this board bring up. Let's pretend we've done a complete port uh, of TouchGFX and we've uh, written some drivers and made some uh, stuff uh, work. Uh, we kind of want to distribute this to uh, whoever else is uh, wanting to develop for this board. So we can actually, using uh, one of the tools that we have in the designer, kind of pack all this up and then we can distribute uh, the file uh, we call an application template uh, and use um, people can use this from inside uh, their own designers. So let's just have a quick look at that. Um, so there is actually, uh, let me just show this browser here. Uh, there is actually a an article for creating a custom application template. Uh, and what it tells us is that, you know, what we should do is now that we have all this uh, code, all these drivers, etc., in here, what we should do is kind of clean it up so it has a minimal size, uh, and then we can call uh, TouchDFX Pack uh, to uh, generate an application template. So let's just try to do that and just show you how to uh, get that into the designer. So I'll just so here. Is the command so it's located uh, inside the uh, designer folder inside your TouchGFX installation, and then tgfx.exe pack. We'll start with just the uh, D argument, which is kind of what generates uh, the pack for us. Prepare some adjacent uh, file for us that we can use to describe this pack to uh, everyone else. And before we do that, we're just going to close down the designer because it's locking some of the the files that we need. Um, let's just try to run it. So I haven't really cleaned anything, so it's going to be, it might be a lot larger than uh, it should be. So now it's found the TouchDFX file, which is the designer file. 
So uh, I'm just going to start processing that. And it's going to pack up all the files. And while it's doing that, I can just show you what I've already done here. Uh, so what it's already done is created a uh, JSON file for me. And I've called this the uh, webinar template. Uh, the board name is obviously F769 Discovery. It's a TouchGFX application template. Uh, and I provide a custom image uh, that will be displayed inside the designer. So now it's created the zip file for us. So the article now tells us to, uh, you know, do all this uh, stuff, uh, describe the application, uh, provide the proper type, the uh, TouchGFX application template, and then use the RC uh, argument to create the final application template which is the TPA file that we'll be distributing. So let's have a look at that. So uh, I've already done, done this. Uh, so while it's uh, doing its work, okay, so it finished before me. I'll just be taking this file and according to the uh, uh, article, we're gonna be installing it inside the packages folder of the designer. So let's go to touch 493 designer, oh, app, packages, just uh, put this in here. And then when we update our designer, start it again, we should have access to this application template. So what basically happened is that it stripped all the GUI that we used for testing. And now when we create a new application based on this webinar template, we're just gonna start with a blank UI because it's a new project. Uh, what happens now is that it's going to create a new application called My Application 4, and it's going to have all this porting code and all this STM32 cube driver code that we generated using CubeMX or took from uh, a driver pack or something. And now it's kind of ready for people to um, to use and create their own applications. Uh, and let's just make it uh, finish. So here we have we're going to be uh, staring at a blank canvas, and we can just start you know, creating our own application now, right? So that's it basically. So now we've gone all the way from uh, talking about, you know, some of the hardware requirements. We've talked about the different layers of TouchGFX. We've talked about the cube drivers and how they fit into the various layers. We've developed a few concrete applications that test this hardware and this, these drivers. Uh, and we've distributed that, that distributed that application template and used it to create a new application. So this is kind of all the way from A to C uh, without discussing uh, the porting specifics. Uh, this is something that we're gonna, we're gonna be talking about in a different webinar, as well as how to protect the frame buffer using uh, real-time operating system primitives, which is the operating system abstraction layer that we saw in a previous slide. Uh, so this is just you know pretending that we already have the port uh, and we already have the drivers and we communicate with some of the peripherals and showed you how to kind of make your application come to life, uh, both from the GUI to the peripherals and from the peripherals to the GUI. Um, so are there any questions at this point? This is the, uh, the end of, of my talk and I uh, just want to say thank you for listening. I hope uh, you enjoyed it and got something out of it. Uh, yeah, we, we have uh, some questions. Uh, most of them are, are correct. We have um, one asking about uh, the IDEs, uh, the plans for actually supporting Atollic True Studio. Um, and I can actually uh, answer this one. Um, right uh, at the moment, we are not su supporting uh, Atollic uh, True Studio, uh, though a lot of customers are using it. Uh, we have a guide uh, and we actually have uh, some forum uh, guidelines uh, also from, from customers uh, supporting you in actually doing uh, TouchDFX projects in, in uh, uh, True Studio of, of, of Atollic. Um, we are working close with, with ST, so, so uh, both with integration uh, with ST Cube but also ST uh, IDEs as Atollic True Studio. So, so this is definitely something that, that will be uh, more integrated uh, and supported uh, looking forward. And I just want to add that um, 
uh, this is a question that we get a lot. You know, what about Atollic uh, integration? What about Eclipse? Anything Eclipse-based STM32 workbench as well? And this is something that we will be uh, creating an article for because the the process is actually fairly simple. Because if you pretend that you generate an Atollic project from uh, CubeMX, for instance, basically it generates a C project for you. So you'll just rename main.c to main.cpp, call a few methods, and basically then you'll have TouchGFX integrated. So the process is really simple, and, and, and we'll be creating an article that shows you how to do that. Yes, yes, Chromart is actually... Uh... Please repeat my question. I, I didn't... Uh... Oh, so, yeah, yeah, using the Chromart is actually very, uh, the very core of how we perform well on ST devices. So that is extremely central, uh, yeah. Okay, good. Um... Before we uh, we close down, uh, I, I will actually yeah uh, ask you to still keep on uh, putting in, in questions. Um, I will like to uh, launch a, a poll here uh, for actually uh, lo looking <laughs> looking into a new uh, topics uh, for, for for upcoming uh, webinars. So please put in your your vote here, and and we will uh, take this into account. Uh, we are in the process of, of planning uh, webinars for for the rest of the year, both counting uh, technical webinars like this one, uh, also counting uh, more uh, actually graphical design, uh, how to, to 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 do graphical designs, um, which is also an important part of a a, a good UI solution. Yeah, please um, make them coming here. And I will close it in a few seconds. We can see the results. Here. Um, yeah. And you are, you are saying here that uh, general uh, porting uh, parts uh, is of your high interest. Um, uh, and, and, and we will definitely uh, do do this. Um, I think also there were some questions about uh, configuring of the DMA and so on. But but this is not a topic of of this uh, webinar. But but we will we will uh, do do this um, uh, in the future. Uh, but also a more advanced application development um, using the TouchGFX designer and also doing more sophisticated coding in in uh, by hand in in C plus um, plus. Great. Um, regarding Art Artas, uh, let me ask you about your usage uh, of, of um, your, your uh, OS. Uh, please put in your vote here. Um, we are using free Artas uh, in our examples, uh, and it comes with TouchGFX. Uh, but TouchGFX is independent on, on, on the Artos, uh, so you can choose anyone. And there are, uh, there's a guide um, helping you in, in, in updating the uh, OS wrapper and, and, and porting to, uh, to another uh, Artos. Uh, just give it a few more seconds here. Okay, I will share it. Oh, it's quite clear here, yeah, free atlas. Um, the others, uh, please put in, in, in writing uh, what you're using here. Um, uh, and, and we will also have this as uh, in consideration uh, doing uh, future seminars on, on, on atlas. Uh, let me yeah, and let's go back to uh, the slides. 
Martin, just go, please. Um, we will be online um, some minutes after after the the, the webinar here, um, answering questions. And I'm just checking if if some is coming in here. Uh, um, and please, when you actually when 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 you leave. Please go through the survey and give us uh, input from from this webinar. Um, this will be uh, will be appreciated uh, very very much. Um, several of you are uh, asking uh, how to actually get uh, the the video here. Um, um, how that will be made available? Sean uh, will send you tomorrow a link with. Uh, uh, for the for the recordings, so you can download and share as as you like, and we will also keep them um, in, in our website, so you can uh, always go back and 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 get it from from our website. And last slide. <laughs> I just have one comment here. Uh, yeah, one is uh, saying uh, I don't use an Atos. Uh, fine, uh, an Atos is not required. You can run on the bare metal. Um, and, and yeah, it's, it's, if, if, if this is what you want, no problem. Uh, TrustFX is, is not needing uh, uh, an Atos. You have a comment for, for, for this? No, that's correct. I mean, yeah. you're you're a bit more limited in in where you can do all your calculation, like in the ports areas. Um, but uh, yeah, you can run without an answer, it's just fine. Okay, thank you everyone for attending uh, today's webinar. We will be back with uh, with a list of uh, upcoming webinars, uh, and I hope you have enjoyed uh, and and learned. Uh, some of the issues uh, you, you were looking for, please put put in your your evaluation on on the survey, and uh, have a have a have a great day. Thank you for now. Bye.